Can they see you? Yeah, okay, good girl. You stay there, okay? Welcome to HeartTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday Garden Question and Answer video that I do on Sundays. I'm shooting this video several days early this week and the sun is kind of changeable right now. So you'll see that I just got bright after I was dark at the beginning. That may happen a few times. Uh, it's, it's bright and sunny outside, but it keeps going in and out of the clouds. So anyway, that'll explain what's going on there. Uh, you can ask questions down below this video and I'll answer them uh, in uh, next week's video or I'll pick from them. I'm getting just crazy amounts of questions on these videos uh, every week. So, I mean, I can't do them all, but I wrote down a lot. Um, I think I've got 18, 19 questions or something like that written down for this week's uh, video. By the time you see this video, um, you will have seen a video with Doug uh, Roaring over at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum on some early season flowering trees. And then a video with Tony Avent uh, over at uh, Juniper Level Botanic Garden. Both of those are great. His is on, his is on shade, um, uh, uh, shade perennials or shade ground covers. Um, um, great video, always a great time. You know, with both of them, that was the first time you guys had seen Doug Roaring um, uh, on my channel. He is, you know, just has an amazing amount of knowledge. I have tons more of these videos planned with other people that you guys haven't seen yet. I think you're going to be amazed before this year is over. There won't be a lot of them in the first half of the year, um, although I did have two this week. There won't be a whole lot of them. I'm kind of pinning myself down here at the house uh, and trying to get some of these projects done that I've been talking about for two years. Although this has moved forward a lot for me and the speed that I normally do things. Um, I feel like I'm kind of behind on some of the uh, things that I wanted to have accomplished by now. So going to hammer those things out and show that to you as we go. And uh, then the second half of the year, uh, lots of video content uh, out on the road. Um, and, and again, I, I've, I've told folks already that a lot of that content will also be in the northern part of the country. Uh, excited about that, just visiting friends up there that you guys have not seen yet. Okay, um, so let's get to some questions uh, from this past week's video. And again, ask them down below and I pick random questions uh, every every week. So thanks for your participation. Somebody asked about the hydrangea, tree-formed hydrangea that I have, um, that I planted. I showed it in a video uh, maybe a month back. Um, so it's been in a, it's actually been in a fairly recent video. I'm going to do a tour video the middle of next week because I've got crazy amounts of bulbs up. And I think by then, more of them will be showing color than, than are currently. And I'll show that tree-formed hydrangea when I do. I've got it pruned just like I want it so that when it leafs out this spring, um, it should put on quite a bit of growth. So uh, it's looking good. Um, I've talked about doing a tour of ugly crepe myrtles in Raleigh uh, last week. And then I walked, th that, like that next day, I was walking down one street in, in the neighborhood and there were probably 30 in a row in the Hell Strip right below um, uh, right below the electric lines that had all been butchered. Um, just really kind of, really kind of funny. But then somebody said I should include forsythia in that, uh, poorly pruned forsythia. There's plenty of that in the neighborhood too. Forsythias that are kept as little round balls that barely have any flowers on them uh, at all. So uh, maybe I'll have to include that. Maybe I'll have to include that as well. Uh, somebody asked about planting around stumps, if they should just raise the soil up and plant directly into the raised mounds. You know, I, I like to raise plants up a little bit just in general because I think, um, you know, t the soil tends to settle under our plants, you know, after we've planted them. And, you know, depending on your soil type, you know, things can stay too wet. Uh, we end up we end up building up mulch over time. And so having them mounted up some is a good idea. I don't really like to plant, and I, I have before. I mean, there have been situations when I was a landscaper that I literally planted on top of the ground. Uh, if you do that, then you need to run some sort of drip irrigation through there. They're going to stay very, very dry. Um, I, I would um, um, get that, um, that uh, root slayer shovel. I mean, I've said this several times recently, and I actually don't own one. I just don't have the type of um, yard that requires a root slayer shovel, but it's a shovel that will cut the roots as you, uh, um, as you dig. You might want to invest in one of those and continue to try to plant things uh, in the ground, especially with stumps, you know, the, the wood will become a little bit easier in time to, uh, to dig through. So that root slayer shovel, or if you do plant on top and you can do that, you're going to have to irrigate them a lot uh, going forward. Uh, let's see. Um, something, somebody asked me what was eating the leaves of their golden euonymus. I don't know what would actually be physically eating the leaves, but golden euonymus get a scale insect called euonymus scale. I've got, now I've got a sun stripe on me. Maybe that's been there the whole time. Um, Looks like I'm wearing some sort of, you know, 
Horticulturalist 2021. Um, okay, uh, Euonymus get a an insect called Euonymus scale. It's actually, um, you know, I had a person tell me a long time ago, there are two types of Euonymus, ones that have scale and ones that are about to get scale. And Golden Euonymus is probably the worst for it. Silver King is a close runner up, but Golden Euonymus, uh, Golden Euonymus, and I've said this before on the channel, it's one of those plants, there's a lot of these, not a lot, but there's a few plants that I, I know are sold, hundreds of thousands of them are sold a year. They're beautiful plants in a container uh, at a garden center, um, box store, wherever you're buying plants. But then I don't see very many of them in the landscape. So, I'm, you know, it becomes a suspicious thing where, you know, something's killing them and, uh, you know, um, the, uh, uh, the, the euonymus scale gets after them pretty hard and, and can make them quite ugly. I don't know what would be eating just an individual leaf, though. I mean, that could be uh, any number of things, caterpillars, who, who, who knows. Um, usually I don't worry about chewing kinds of insects, but things like scale, you know, can be devastating to a uh, plant. But it's usually stressed plants. I've talked about this many times. The plants that succumb to those kinds of things are usually stressed plants. And so, you know, there's something... There's something genetically inferior about golden euonymus that makes it susceptible to that scale insect. So I would discourage people from buying them just in general. They're beautiful. They look fantastic in, a, in, in, in the nursery. They look fantastic in garden centers. Uh, but I just don't see many of them in the landscape that look good. Um, and there's exceptions to that. Trust me, there'll be somebody down below going, my golden euonymus, best plant in the yard. But overall, there are hundreds of thousands sold a handful that I see that look good. So something has to be going on there. Uh, somebody um, bought a mountain snow pieris and they're in zone 9A and the tag says zone 8. Uh, wanted to know, um, it's much harder to force plants in that direction than it is the other direction. You know, I've got palms that are barely hardy here. I've got a lot of zone 8 plants in this, in this garden. I've got um, sweet viburnum. I've got I've, there's several. Um, key, uh, uh, Pineapple guava, you know, lots of zone eight plants in, in my zone seven landscape. Um, that's much easier than having a zone, uh, a zone seven or zone eight max heat, you know, area uh, and putting it in zone nine. Um, it's a little bit different. So there's not a whole lot you can do. You want to put it out probably in a little more open space, not in the sun. It needs, it's a shade plant. But not, I wouldn't tuck it up against your foundation because that would hold some additional heat during the winter time. You want to put it out there where it can get whatever cool nights you're going to get uh, during the winter um, on it. And at this point, you just got to plant it and see what happens. But definitely in zone nine, it's a shade plant. Um, and you know, my uh, mountain snow Pieris was in a video last week. Um, if you want to go back and look at that video, um, and it's in it's in full bloom, looks fantastic. I think I'll have an Instagram post uh, on it in the next couple of days, and it only gets about three hours of direct sun the rest of the day. It's in the shade back there. Okay, um, somebody said uh, they're looking for larger plants in the Raleigh area, and um, uh, they were looking for some larger boxwoods, and then. Um, if they can't find larger boxwoods, they wanted other deer resistant plants. I mean, you can plant gardenias, abelias, osmanthus. Fragrant plants are your friend um, if you have deer problems, uh, typically. Uh, that or poisonous plants. Um, fragrant and poisonous plants. Um, uh, I showed a video with Sean Gherkin, uh, my buddy that works down at Adcox Nursery recently. Adcox is open to the public and they tend to have larger pots, seven gallon, 15 gallon, 25 gallon, even 50 gallon. Uh, material down there and uh, somebody there can probably help you out on what's uh what's deer resistant um and what's not we, i think sean and i in that video if you want to go back and look it up talked about a few deer resistant things uh while we were uh showing some things off at that nursery okay um somebody said they're buying plants now and how long can they stay in the pots they can stay in the pots a long time most plants that you're buying now were meant for spring sales so they were meant to last in the containers through through spring for sure. Um, you know, once something starts needing you to water it more than once a day, it really needs to go uh, in the ground. And that will happen with container plants. If they keep them in a container long enough, they'll start, you know, you'll water it and then five hours later need to water it again. Once they get to that point, you either have to pot them into a larger pot or get them into the ground. The other thing that happens on nursery plants, nursery fertilizers are very specific for the length of time that they last. 
And so as an example, I would plant uh, rooted cuttings. You know, I rooted plants in these kind of cell trays like this at my nursery. And we take a rooted cutting and put it into a trade gallon pot. And based on how long it would take to grow that trade gallon out to be a sellable size is the fertilizer that we would use. So if it was something that was fast, like a spirea, as an example, if I took the spirea, planted it into a trade gallon pot, that plant only takes maybe, if I was planting it in April, I could finish it by fall and send it out to another nursery. So I was using a fertilizer that was a five to six month fertilizer. So that it would literally run out about the time my buddy that I sold them to at another nursery was potting them into a three gallon pot. And then he would put an eight to nine month fertilizer or something like that on them based on how long they thought that they would have them before they were finished. If you understand what I'm saying, plants that are going to garden centers in the spring, that fertilizer is going to run out sometime during the spring. They, they, were, they were very specifically timed uh, to do that because it's less expensive to have a two to three month fertilizer than a 10 to 12 month fertilizer or a 12 to 14 month fertilizer. So that's how fertilizing is done in a nursery. They're very specific. So your fertilizers will also start to run out um, by late spring. So, but you can keep them in the pots for weeks and weeks, uh, probably without any problem. But if you see them starting to off color, that's the fertilizer running out. If you're having to water them too often, you know, get them in the ground. Um, long answer. Okay, somebody has some, uh, what they call lords and ladies. It's uh, um, Arum uh, maculatum uh, that uh, is taking over a wooded area behind them and it's gotten very close to them and they want to know how to get rid of them. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that's a, you know, that's a tuberous uh, perennial and uh, you know, there are only three ways to get rid of anything. You either have to cover it with something that won't, is impervious to it coming through, like a piece of clear plastic, or you have to spray them or you have to dig them out. Um, that's your three options. There are no, uh, I, I get those questions all the time. Like there's some sort of secret, you know, to getting rid of invasive plants that are creeping in on you. Um, they're just not. You either have to physically dig them out, spray them uh, with a, with a, with a um, herbicide, um, something that hopefully won't hurt the other things that are there, or you have to cover them with some sort of clear piece of plastic for some period of time. And if it's getting enough sunlight on it, that can kind of cook them underneath the plastic. Sometimes that can take a very long time. You know, I've seen, I've covered things for months before and uncovered them and it came right back. Bermuda grass being one of them. <laughs> it just seems to sit under it like, okay, I'm gonna outweigh you. But um, you know, that's it. There's no shortcuts, um, unfortunately. Um, but the, you know, those are the three, those are the three ways that you can do it. Uh, plants that have, uh, rhizomes under the ground or tubers under the ground, bulbs under the ground, whatever it is, those plants tend to be somewhat resistant to herbicides initially. So they take repeat applications in order to work. You got to knock the foliage back several times. Not recommending you do it that way. I'm just telling you that's one of the three ways that you could knock them back. So that's up to you. Uh, somebody has a camellia that has some sort of leaf spot problem, some leaves turning uh, black on it wanted to know if there's a if I would recommend a fungicide for it. I wouldn't. I don't know what's what's going on with it. But you can clean clean your tools and prune some of that material out, and then see how and fertilize it. Make sure it's well mulched. Make sure it's watered when it needs water. See if you can get it back in good shape just by taking care of the area. They had just bought this house. See if you can get it back in shape. If it continues to cause you a problem. Uh, dig it out and uh, and get something new. Some of the newer variety cultivars of Camellia sesanquas are much more de uh, much more disease resistant than some of the older varieties. This is a conversation um, I actually had with some nurserymen the other night that some older varieties of Camellias, ones that have been around for 50 years or more, um, are somewhat suscept more susceptible to disease issues. I don't recommend fungicides pretty much ever for ornamental landscaping. I mean. I don't know that anything ever gets solved by it. Like if I was gonna treat leaf spot on my big leaf hydrangeas with a fungicide, guess what I'm gonna have to do next year? I'm gonna have to spray that same fungicide. So if it's, if it's me and it looks like it's a pattern, uh, it's gonna develop a pattern of me having to spray something year after year after year, season after season, that plant's going away. Um, that, that's how I look at that. Somebody has a shady area, wants to know if they can grow zoysia grass. They've got Bermuda there currently and it's super thin as you would expect in a shady space. Um, I've got that Zeon zoysia here. Um, and while it is the most shade tolerant of zoysias so far, uh, there's a limit to that. It really would prefer um, more sun than shade. My turf in the back is definitely thinner. My turf in the front where I get tons of sun, it's perfect. I mean, literally it's perfect. There's 20, 30 weeds out there right now that need to be hand pulled. 
but the back is definitely thinner. Um, there's also dog traffic on it. There's been more foot traffic on it because there's been so much work being done back here. So part of that's my fault, but also just in general, it's, I, I'm at the edge of the minimum amount of sunlight uh, that it needs. And so um, it's more vulnerable to my foot traffic and watering and that kind of thing. So just keep that in mind. I, I don't, Xeon's always just the most shade tolerant. Don't know if it, I don't know how much shade you actually have. Uh, okay, so I get this question all the time about using coffee grounds and other things to put out in the garden. And then people read if is it good or is it bad to use coffee grounds in the garden. Almost nothing like that is going to be bad for your garden if you just spread it out far and wide. Okay, so uh, don't worry about it. Just you can use it in your garden. Don't just don't concentrate it on things. Don't concentrate anything on anything. Okay, no fertilizer, no nothing. Anything you add to your garden spread it out thin and far and wide so that it doesn't concentrate something in one spot. So yes, you can use your coffee grounds in the garden. They may be slightly beneficial, um, but if you concentrate them all in one spot over and over and over again, I can guarantee you they won't be beneficial. They'll be, they'll be problematic. So with, that, with anything you're putting out there that somebody recommends you use, that's adding anything, any nutrient to your garden, spread it out thin and far and wide. I doubt you drink enough coffee that you could cover the whole yard in a damaging amount as long as you kept finding new areas to put it. Okay, um, somebody said they have deer eating their hellebores and wanted to know if stinking hellebores would be better. Hellebores are poisonous um, or mildly poisonous and generally deer don't eat them. Um, that doesn't mean that deer won't eat them. Deer will eat there's no plant that I've ever put a video up that I said was deer resistant that somebody doesn't have a comment down at the bottom that their deer ate them or at least sampled them enough to damage them. You know, um, cause that's all it can take on a small plant is the deer to come along, eat three branches off of it, realize it hates it, but it's, it did a significant amount of damage very quickly. Um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, you know, if that's actually what happened or not, I mean, it could be slugs. Uh, or another thing that can get um, on your hellebores. And if your deer are eating hellebores, I doubt that the, um, the stinking hellebores are gonna be any different. They are a different species, uh, but you know, I, I don't know. I, you know that, that, that's the answer to that, I just don't know. And it would surprise me if you had deer eating hellebores. But somebody down below, is, like I say, I just said something about deer on a specific plant. There'll be a couple people down below that will say, deer ate my hellebores. Um, so, um, I already know that deer, deer, well, at least they'll, they'll try things even to find out that they don't like them. So, um, um, again, I, I just, I, I don't know the answer to that. I doubt there's any difference if they're eating one, um, already, boy, you'd be running out of things if you can't plant hellebores. Uh, that would be, that would be real tough. That'd be real tough to garden with deer if you couldn't use hellebores in a shady area. Um. Well, somebody asked me if the wood, um, you know, I'm using these wood chips in the paths back here, if the wood chips would have any negative impact on Holly's right here uh, on, you know, she gets splinters in her paws or anything. I don't think so. I've used them for years. I mean, I was at Plant Delight shooting that video and their cats walking all those um, wood chip trails. I mean, it's, soft, it's kind of soft uh, to walk on. Of course, with any kind of wood like that, you can hit something the wrong way and obviously get a splinter. But I mean, Dogs' pads are used to working on, walking on a forest floor, so um, I just never thought about it as problematic. Sometimes, sometimes we, you know, just uh, think of things, you know, to to find to find maybe problems where there aren't. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, somebody asked about chlor is chlorine in the water damaging to microbes in the soil, and the answer is uh, somewhat. I mean, initially, chlorine will um, do small amounts of damage um, if you're if when you're watering your plants with it. And, and um, if you have a, a compost pile, uh, same thing. Um, it, it can cause some damage. But we're talking about things, as long as you have a good, healthy soil and you're you know, doing some of the things I talk about, keeping it covered with compost, mulch, fertilizing with organic fertilizers, these things replicate so fast that it will overcome uh, that little bit of damage. But yeah, obviously any, you know, that's what chlorine's for, is killing microbes, but it won't do any damage. Um, and, and I guess there have been some studies on this where there's uh, slight drops, you know. Um, so moderation with it, I mean, and that's true with any watering you're doing. Hopefully you're not, um, 
you know, having to irrigate every day with chlor you know, chlorinated water on your uh, landscape. Hopefully you can water kind of heavily and then not water for a few days or a week. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody asked me about a winter Daphne update. The little tour video that I put up a week or so ago, maybe seven, eight days ago, you can go back and look at that. Both, both of the in-ground winter Daphne are in flower and we're on, on that video. Uh, somebody asked how old is Holly? Holly is 13 and um, she's got, uh, she's, <laughs> she's 10, aren't you? You're 13 years old. She's definitely slowing down. Her face was black originally um, and uh, now you as you can see it's all white. And she's got these crazy blue eyes that everybody loves. But she, uh, she's 13. Um, I've kind of resided or I've kind of decided that like the next year there won't be any trips um, the next year or two, whatever. I'm hope for the longest I can get, but there won't be any trips that are planned without her. So my channel, you know, I don't care what opportunities come my way, uh, she won't be left, um, you know, in the next uh, in the next year or two. Uh, she's losing mass in both of her back legs, and she's 13. You know, it, it happens. I've um, I've outlived I've outlived a lot of dogs in this life, and this one. This is the this is the best dog I've ever had. I've had some great dogs, but this dog has just been unbelievable. You know, you guys have seen her. I mean, I have 1,100 videos on this channel. She's probably in 500 of them, and she's just shockingly well behaved. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing. This is getting brighter and brighter. I think. Okay, uh, somebody asked about growing sweet peas in the south because they've been told they were easy, and then you know they they put them in in April and they're not. Uh, actually, you can plant sweet peas in the fall here. Uh, in the south, and uh, they will uh, germinate, come up about this high, and then they'll kind of sit there through the winter, but then they'll be well rooted. And right about now, as the soil temperature is warming up, they'll grow like crazy and then they'll bloom. So that's, that's our strategy for growing sweet peas, where people up in zone five, zone six A, uh, they can uh, plant them in the spring and expect to you know, have them up and through early to midsummer. So that's the way to do that. Uh, somebody bought a Stellar Ruby Magnolia. This is question number 18. I got two more after this. Uh, Stellar Ruby uh, Magnolia, and it's got six stems in the pot. Uh, and they wanted to know if they can divide it. Um, I probably wouldn't because I think dividing it would end up, <laughs> you, may, you may kill all of them. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it, you can if you want to try it. But for me, I'm probably just going to cut the ones out that I don't want, keep the most vigorous stem, maybe cut it down to three to start with, and then you know, decide which ones are more vigorous and then and get it down to one eventually. Um, but uh, you can probably divide it, but I mean, that risk of killing them all um, or setting it back uh, in a big way. Uh, then somebody asked if I'm gonna be doing a potato planting video. Yes, they actually went in today. I shot video for it. You'll see that video like Tuesday-ish. Uh, you'll see my next round of seeding. I've already filled some trays back here. So this will be tomatoes, and things that need about four to six weeks before they get transplanted will be planted this week. My cool season vegetables are going in the ground and potatoes have already gone in the bags. So if you're in my area, you can go ahead and put your potatoes in your grow bags and I'm just putting them in compost. Oh, you can put them in the ground too, but it's about, I do potatoes three to four weeks before my last frost. I'm a little early. I'm about five to six weeks before my average last frost. So I, I start them a little early, but typically it's about three weeks before your last frost. Uh, so, and then the last question for this week, somebody asked me if I have um, had experience with Magnolia Stellata, the video that went up from, uh, uh, with Doug, Warren, uh, Doug Roran over at the uh, Ralston on uh, Tuesday has lots about uh, Magnolia Stellata. So if you want to go back and watch that video, and I planted uh, one at the old house as well before I moved up here. I won't have any deciduous magnolias in this landscape. I love them in other people's yards in the neighborhood. There's a lot of those plants for me. I, I love them, um, but I don't necessarily want one because they take up a lot of space and this is a very, very small lot. So in order to get as many plants in here as possible for me to teach with, for me to enjoy, for me to have other people come over here and enjoy, uh, I'm not planting things that get really, really big. So that's the only reason, but I do, I do love them. I will say that Magnolia stellatas, you know, star magnolias, are a little more vulnerable to frost in my area. All deciduous magnolias are, you know, can be, can get freeze damaged. I mean, they all try to go off way too early. Um, 
but saucer magnolias tend to bloom maybe a week or so later, two weeks later than the star magnolias do, and therefore end up at least slightly less likely to be damaged. They still get damaged as well. So that's it. Uh, thank you guys for participating. That was a 20 of probably, I'd have no idea how many questions were asked. So keep asking them. I'll keep picking from them uh, every week. And uh, again, uh, see you soon. Thanks for watching.